quite an extraordinary group. Welcome to Redlands, those of you who are here, and welcome to this session, all of those of you who are online. Um, as, as some of you know, this is a launching pad for this profession, this event. Uh, it has evolved through systematic work of individuals and sharing their work. So this, this week is an important week. It's a chance for us to, again, catch up on each other's work, understand what each other is doing, and learn from each other. So I would characterize the purpose of the meeting is uh, learning. Wouldn't you say learning, Carl? Is that a kind of way to say it? And then understanding um, and sharing and meeting other people and building friendships and building professional colleagues in this endeavor that we're up to. So I, I like to think of it as a transformational kind of operation, one that is, is ultimately going to transform our world. And if you look at the definition of transformation, it's not just change, it's to basically leave behind the past and focus on the future. So I would say you as practitioners are laying the first footprints for a better world, a transformed world, a world where things are done differently. So I would assert that the fundamental technologies of geography and GIS, the geography, the science, and GIS, the tools, uh, are emerging into an infrastructure platform that geodesign can really prosper on top of. And that will deliver value, uh, transformational value all over the world. So computer companies often say we are transforming the organization, we're transforming the world. <laughs> I'm sick of listening to all those ads and advertisements for that kind of talk. But I think in this setting, I want to sort of change the, the, the sort of propaganda and talk about transforming the world with science and design. So science and design, I think, can actually transform the world. It isn't just being at the effect of rapid technology changes, and I acknowledge that technology is really uh, having a huge impact on our society and our civilization, but without, without directed conscious thinking about uh, where the world is going to go, uh, is sort of out of control. And here's where we can bring scientific thinking and design thinking into creating a kind of future that we think we should have, a sustainable future. And that's what this meeting and what your, obviously your profession is all about. Now, the applic applications of this kind of thinking provide us the evidence that we're onto something. And these applications are in almost every field. They're underpinning the way that we're now approaching environmental modeling and assessment. They're underpinning how we manage the information about our land, our owners, uh, the ownership of land, the cadaster. They're underpinning the way that we are doing urban planning and geodesign and, and land use planning of various types all over the world. Uh, they are underpinning the way that we're beginning to think about managing buildings, sustainable building management, looking at alternative buildings in the context of of existing cities, understanding the impacts of them, optimizing space in buildings. They are, it is going right into engineering. So geographic context, the science of engineering is, and the tools uh, the, are the geographic sciences underpinning how we're doing engineering and how we're thinking about engineering. Uh, it's helping us optimize transportation at all scales and on all different modes. And airports now, modern airports like Atlanta or Houston or Los Angeles or Amsterdam or, or uh, Beijing are all little cities and a digital twin that are supporting operations and, and evaluations. We're seeing it at uh, macro scales like road networks. We're seeing it in transit. We're seeing it across the world. Uh, in, in most cities today, most cities 
are safer because geography and GIS is there looking at patterns of crime, predicting things, uh, developing more secure strategies, let's call them designs for <laughs> making safer cities. And in utilities, our friends in the utility business are, are building asset inventories and then managing asset inventories and designing uh, strategies for maintaining their assets effectively using the principles of, of geography and geographic science. And boy, this is, this is creating huge value. Uh, in the business world, people like Starbucks and Walmarts and Walgreens are locating business. They're understanding uh, demographics. Uh, they're understanding markets. They're understanding logistics. They're optimizing logistics based on, on digital geography and uh, the very tools that many of you are practicing in. And in a couple of weeks, those of you who are from the United States will be taking the census. And the census this time is completely built out of uh, geographic principles. <laughs> the collector devices will be GIS connected. The aggregation of the census will be all uh, meshed together. And uh, we, we will see some pretty miraculous progress in geostatistics and analyzing uh, demographics. But it's also an environment which is uh, uh, enormously helpful to things like, uh, like what all of us are a little bit afraid about, the, uh, the coronavirus. Uh, today, there's over 80,000 people that have that disease, and every 10 minutes there's a database with dashboards. You'll see it perhaps uh, this afternoon when you walk around that is showing and tracking exactly the spread of this disease. Other diseases have been able to get in the box, been put in the box through geographic strategies, things like Ebola and uh, polio. Uh, these, are, these are miraculous transformational ways, uh, that, uh, ways that we have transformed how we look at diseases and their spread. Uh, the big challenges of homelessness today in America are now being addressed with uh, looking at patterns and relationships and trying to understand what is the root cause and also how to, how to address these problems. Um, and finally, the world is, a, is, I guess, a safer place because we can at least understand, predict patterns of these uh, disasters, fires, hurricanes, <clears throat> sea level rise, short-term disasters, long-term disasters, and respond more effectively. This work, and I've just been cruising through it very quickly, is alive and well in literally hundreds of thousands of organizations. And these organizations are increasingly making their data available openly for other people to use. Now that's, that's something new. The idea that open data and open geographic data and open services data is becoming available for designers and planners and thinkers so that they can simply connect over the web to this data and make it come alive. And people are now using these new technologies to not only find data, like you do a Google search or a geospatial data search, but also contribute to these data sets through things like crowdsourcing. The Christmas bird count a few weeks ago was done entirely on GIS with devices. We're connecting people, collecting data, and then that data is going directly into the cloud and directly being able to be used. So, wow, it's a lot to say. I, I would say we're in the process of transforming thousands of organizations, actually hundreds of thousands of organizations, and creating a better future. This is your work, really. This is actually what you are doing. Aspiring to create smarter communities, to engage citizens, to do more integrated thinking and leveraging the best science and technology to, to approach problem solving more holistically. Don't you like that idea? Is this why you're here, actually, isn't it? I mean, to really try to figure this out. I mean, look, my slides are nice and beautiful. It's a messy world. It's not so simple as my beautiful slides are suggesting, but this is our aspiration. You know, my personal aspiration is to get this geographic thinking and geographic information into every organization in the world. 
that's a bold thing to say, bold ass thing for me to say. But look, Bill Gates said he had an aspiration of wanting to put a laptop on every desk. Remember that? A few billion laptops later, the world became more. So I just would suggest that maybe all of us could think about this idea of, wouldn't it be interesting if every organization was able to have access to uh, the most powerful geospatial or geographic information. That's, that's worth working for, ladies and gentlemen. That's worth going for. <laughs> Look, what's next for our world? I ask this question a lot. I ask it of me personally. What's next for me and what's next for, for the place I work? What's next for my little community of Redlands? You know, I suppose you have these same kind of questions. Uh, what's next for the state of California? What's next for my country? You guys think about that? I think about it all the time when I'm looking at the damn news. What's next for our country? Uh, or what's next for the world? And in that order, uh, it's interesting to think about what we can do as, in your case, geodesigners or geographers or, or technicians or scientists. What can we do particularly when we now understand that our world is living. It's like a little living organism. It's similar to the nervous systems of our bodies. It's always cha we are always changing. And in the case of the world, we're fundamentally part of it. And uh, you might say, I'm starting to realize there's too many of us. <laughs> Doesn't that bother you? <laughs> I mean, there's too damn many of us. Our human footprint, we are overpopulated, extends probably double or triple what we can sustain as a living planet. So we're not sustainable at this particular point. And this is leading us to realize there's huge loss in biodiversity. There's social conflict. Not that there hasn't always been social conflict, but it's seemingly more and more environmentally caused. Uh, we are losing, at a very alarming rate, uh, diversity of, of other living critters that also occupy our, our common ground. Um, we are polluting our world, and we're doing it at a rate that's, like I say, not sustainable. Doesn't this alarm you? And we can, we can do little things, like we can clean up transform, decarbonize, all those things that everybody's working on. But fundamentally, we need to look at geography, the science of our world, and address the greater challenges. And also, we have to have less people. <laughs> That's my, my current conclusion. Uh, wouldn't life be better? Like when I was a kid, there was about a third of the people. My little town was better. We didn't worry about so many things. Uh, we weren't challenged by some of these issues that we currently have. And if you take it at the state of the national or the global level, uh, it's a very scary proposition today. Our world, I'll assert, needs a kind of nervous system, an intelligent and responsive platform that, like your brain and your central nervous system, senses things and cognates and understands and then more intelligently responds. It creates understanding. Um, well, and also in our case, in the geodesign field, we're looking at how we can have collaboration, better understanding and collaboration, and then systematic action, action which reflects the consequences of action, not just action, action which is underpinned by understanding, understanding preceding action. And for me, geography is essential for that. Geography is the science of our world. It's, it provides us rich content, and it also provides us a kind of context, and it's a common reference system that people can relate with. People all experience it. So it's, it's very intuitive. It helps us see complexity the relationships and patterns. It helps us bring holistically together all that we experience either in our 
individual disciplines or sciences or in individual experiences as we go through life. It brings it all together. And it helps us understand all of these pieces. It helps us respond more effectively. And in these last 50 years, GIS has been successful. It's successful at abstracting geographic knowledge digitally, systematically into layers of information, uh, layers of all types, all sciences, social layers, physical layers, environmental layers, biological layers. And it also allows us to integrate these different bring the world back together, bring the world, whatever that world is that we're working on together, and apply it in projects. So we have project-based GISs, millions of them actually. Um, geographic systems, which organize systematically our geographic knowledge and allow it to be used and applied to various applications. And then more recently, a pattern that has been emerging is a system of systems, which using the web is interconnecting our individual projects and systems so that we can have access to, to comprehensive measurements and data. All of you guys knew these, didn't you? You knew this was going on? Perhaps not so much the last one, because it's starting to emerge. This is what I'd call an emerging technology, the connection, interconnection of all of the individual systems. And geodesign, as, as um, many people have defined it, is a design and planning methodology. It provides us a framework and a process for integrating geographic sciences into our engineering and planning and land planning activities. It allows us to create alternatives and evaluate quickly the impacts systematically. It also involves all the stakeholders and it helps us holistically design our future so that it's more sustainable. These are snippets of the information that you'll be receiving this week. GIS combined with this geodesign process provide us a framework and a process to take all of our measurements. There are many people that are just interested in aerial photography and survey measurements and forest inventories and visualize it and then model it, analyze the processes, interpret these models so that they can support design and planning holistically and then support decision making and ultimately action. Now this this process and this framework resembles your nervous system, your, how you actually think. It, it starts with sensing, your brain senses. It results in understanding and then supports response, stimulus response. But you have this cognition operating in your head that says go this way, not that way, because this way is dangerous, or this way will impact you, or this way is better, or this way, whatever. So what I think we're trying to do here is replicate that nervous system, but at a planetary level. Now, how, how is that gonna actually happen? Some of it has to do with the technology, the ability to take distributed, measured, measurement assets and modeling assets and bring them together. Sharing information is one of the big keys. Your work in projects or your work in building individual systems is starting to get interconnected at many scales. Web services are the magic. I can serve you my data and you can bring it in and mash it up. You can reference it with strong metadata and Gradually, over time, it's not a matter of one person doing it all. It's a matter of collaboration in an open system where we have sharing of work at scale to define this nervous system for the planet. You get it? 
a bit abstract, but uh, stay with me. The notion is building geospatial infrastructure, which in many ways is GIS at scale. In the old days, we might have said that stack of layers of data was an information system in a database can, and many people would use a common database can. But today, we can magically link together distributed systems and virtually overlay each other's data to see. And individual people, like an individual designer in, you know, in Redlands, can look at the data online and bring data from other sources together by searching and mashing it up. But also we can work in you know, in Boston and Harvard, for example, or at, in Germany, at the same time with teams, collaborative teams, using bringing the data together and visualizing across the web. And whole organizations can do this, like a city planning department, or a whole community of citizens and planners and scientists working around a common virtual environment that's distributed and interconnected where sharing and collaboration is one of the big themes. It's not just my design, it's our design. It's not just my strategy, it's working together. And that calls from, for some clever engineering. And my colleagues um, and the world at large have been working on this idea that we can do distributed access to multiple formats of data, hundreds of them, imagery data, tabular data, unstructured data, real-time IoT data, big data, CAD data, imagery data. We can abstract the data, no matter what the format is, into a common language of maps and 3D scenes. Uh, shared services, that's a popular IT term. We can access distributed shared services. I can access imagery that's being captured in Europe and bring it into my, my design process almost in real time. And access in real time IoT, like things moving around, where the animals are, where the, where the cars are, where the people are, and, and mash it up into a new dynamic, real time kind of planning environment. Uh, this is an example of, of something that was done by an engineering firm in the UK. They're looking at the big new um, British Rail exercise billions of dollars. They're integrating geographic layers, uh, 3D building layers, uh, BIM models. This is a BIM model of a subway station. I can access it. it. They're all coming from different sources, right? I can fly around it. I can look underneath it. I can brief the public with it. They can understand more effectively than these individual silos of data that have been captured, some by engineers, some by architects, some by planners, some by geographers, etc. It's uh, very cool. And I can examine one subway station like this, but I can simply say, well, how does this one compare to one that's, you know, 50 miles away or 50 kilometers away and go, I mean, just imagine the data here. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I can just zoom around, pan around, by bringing different disciplines together and their own individual technology formats. Uh, and that virtualized data can then be seen and applied in a whole plethora of different applications. Desktop, geodesign applications, visualization applications. In my device, I can see it on a dashboard. So I'm wiring up the planet with geospatial infrastructure. And this distributed geography of knowledge can be integrated into apps that help me design and plan. So the theme here is GIS at scale. And then specialized applications or focused applications that can help me in the natural world plan forests better, in the built environment plan cities better, transportation, address issues of security, issues of, of environmental contamination. I can have the full deck of knowledge. Practically speaking, that's just a whole lot cheaper because at least when I was in school, you know, they always said 90% of the, 
of the project is spent on data collection and analytics. Suppose that we could actually access all that information from a workstation and access powerful analytics that don't even live on my machine, that live halfway around the world, accessing the best of AI and machine learning, or distributed open science tools, or real-time measurement coming in. It's not going to all be on my desktop, but imagine for free, I could access this wealth of, of information to power the design process, the decision-making process. This is powerful. And also that this infrastructure gets frictionless. Pervasive web apps can access the same information that designers are building. Massive mobile deployments, so as all of you have these little devices, I can access in real time or I can collect data in real time, like the Christmas bird count, contributing back to the infrastructure. We get connected. We are active players in the building of the infrastructure and the users of the infrastructure. And this infrastructure gets embedded. In other words, geographic knowledge gets embedded into other big systems like ERP systems or CRM systems or engineering systems or graphic design systems or BI systems or geodesign systems. And this takes this vision that I laid out that you guys thought, oh, kind of, oh. No, it takes it to scale. It's totally going to be possible to achieve the idea that geographic knowledge can be embedded into every organization on the planet, every NGO, every government, every city, every state, every national government on the planet. So if we're going to address this human footprint catastrophe that we're headed into, man, we've got to geospatially enable the whole planet. And that means not just individuals. I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about organizations, the vehicles which actually accomplish real work. And we have to engage communities. There is emerging tools called Hub, which allow citizens and academics and NGOs and others to connect through web maps and apps and get involved. They can collaborate together. They can take on an initiative like clean up the streets. There's a small city south of here called Escondido, which has got 8,000 volunteers connected. <laughs> They're all cleaning up the trash. It's really a beautiful city now. They really, I'd say they have some homelessness, but not much because they're connected. The city has organized geospatially their city, and they're working on it together because they don't have enough employees in the city to do all the work. They want all the citizens engaged, and the citizens want to be engaged. They just have never had a mechanism to geospatially get connected. Well, I've been talking on and on here. What I'm talking ultimately about is geospatial transformation, transforming organizations interconnecting information and, um, and all happening at the same time. This idea of using the power of geographic science to help us understand and then integrate our various activities. This is, this is a bold vision and requires a lot of work by a lot of people. But what I think will happen is that the dashboards and public information sets will make make make, will we'll make these, these responsive, they'll make us more responsive as a society because they're going to be reporting everything, like they're reporting the flu virus right now. The UN is buying into this at the global scale with their SDG program, wiring everything together to have uh, global reporting. Local, so again, this is evidence that this forecast that I'm sort of suggesting is going to actually happen. And that'll cause a revolution. It'll actually, it'll actually change how we do work. It'll change how we see things and how we act. And we'll still have the problems of overpopulation and uh, you know, the political polarization about what we do about various problems. These, these are not things that geography exactly is gonna help with, but um, at least from my own personal perspective, I'm really talking about going 
forward with science and technology not being, I mean, it's hard to avoid being at the effect of, of going to the right or going to the left radically, but the main direction is pushing forward with science and tools and design thinking that layers on top of this powerful force. Your work is essential in this, actually. It's, um, it's not, it's not going to happen unless people are actually bought into it. It takes leadership in private firms and in government agencies and in the academy. It takes envisioning what's possible. It takes values for learning and sharing and collaborating. The reason why you are here you want to make friends and figure out how to, what to do. It requires strategic thinking. In, in my little town, we're trying to figure out what to do with the downtown. Um, there's on the right, there on the left, and up or down, or what? It requires strategic thinking and engaging everybody in the process. And also, it requires what I see so frequently in design professionals, a passion. Didn't you kind of get into this because you had a passion to do something, design something great, uh, or mean something in the world? I think this is, this, is a, this is a very personal thing. Well, uh, Ryan asked if I'd also give a very, very brief uh, summary of what we're doing here at ESRI. ESRI uh, is the author of ArcGIS, and more recently we've been building a series of related products. We sometimes call them geo-enabled systems for focused workflows because not everybody wants to learn the details of how you manage a GIS. They just want to do uh, very specific workflows. Our heart is uh, about building software products that empower other people to do good work. And over the years, we've been successful from a business institutional perspective, especially in GIS, but more recently in simple mapping and location services. And we'll show you today in a few demonstrations an adventure that we're starting in creating geo-enabled systems that are quite focused. Uh, ArcGIS is the heart of our work. It's really an information system about geographic stuff. So it lives in lots of cities and lots of utilities and lots of government agencies. Um, it's it's uh, services-based, web services-based now. It's open and interoperable and extendable. A lot of people, millions of people actually use it. It works on desktops and in servers to support systems. It involves a lot of cloud services. And more recently, we've been promoting this idea of interconnecting our users to create this idea of a system of systems. It isn't by, by, by design that it, ha well, it's by design that you can, you can make this happen, but it really involves the values and institutional structures of our users to realize this infrastructure. But I believe in it. I believe it'll come into being. It actually actually already is at many scales. Um, our work, there's about 1,500 people over in a building that some of you are going to be working, uh, going through and about 19 different development centers around the planet that are working on advancing ArcGIS. And they do it with more content and, well, you can glance through these tools. They're working on creating billions of dollars of online content that are available to designers and planners and, and GIS users. They call it the living atlas. But there's also millions of shared data sets, about 30 million shared data sets that our users are sharing, so they're using each other's data. This is growing exponentially. In the last couple of weeks, uh, they've been making several billion maps a day. Um, about half of that is for the coronavirus. It's just extraordinary information. So this thing will scale. And there's rich tools in the toolbox that make smart mapping. 
interactive mapping. There's rich tools that now that tell stories, story maps. Some of you have seen these story map uh, capabilities. We're making now about 3,000 of these story maps a day. People are telling stories. They have a map and they have text and they have photos. And I suspect that by the end of this year, it's going to be 10,000 stories told a day. It's kind of like a new PowerPoint <laughs> for geographic storytelling. Um, GIS is becoming 3D. It actually has extraordinary tools now to read in BIM tools, to read in reality mesh LIDAR data, to read in extrusions of 2D data into 3D, and then support 3D applications. Uh, lots of powerful 3D visualization tools keep advancing every year. And with the new data types that are coming, like massive LIDAR point cloud measurement, wow, I never imagined that it would support uh, these volumes of data at, at such performance and in any device. It's also being integrated into design and engineering tools like our colleagues at Autodesk Corporation. So ArcGIS services can now be fed directly into these, the, these tools so that you can see geographic context for the engineering and design work that's being done. And that's just beginning. Lots of spatial analytic tools, actually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. These are just a few of the new ones that are coming along. Integration with AI and machine learning and deep learning. Imagery integration. Actually, ArcGIS is a complete imagery data management and exploitation system. It does image data management and beautiful visualization and map production and analytics. It supports the idea of field data collection and field people tracking, collecting data from the field, integrating it in real time into a shared environment for people to use. It supports the idea of people managing people remotely using maps and geography. And, and then there, there are dozens of other things that you will see little previews of. But I want to call out or distinguish a different adventure that ESRI is taking, which is to build focused, workflow-focused systems around key, a few key areas. These are model areas for not rebuilding a GIS, but using geographic information system data to support workflows of key individuals, supporting indoor facility management, supporting citizen engagement, supporting urban planning, supporting business analysis, and supporting critical missions uh, during disasters or times of emergency. I'm just going to pick on two of these, but my colleagues will show them in much richer uh, detail in a moment. This one is called Urban, and this is about gathering together and putting into a cloud system all the indicators which should guide development in a city, and then allowing planners to put in plans, 3D plans of zoning, land use, etc., uh, and other related constraints. And then allowing projects to be tested. How would this building look in this setting? What's the view shed? What's the impact on, on infrastructure, etc.? The second of these is called Hub. This is an uh, adventure we've been working on for a few years. This allows us to set up an initiative. This is what they did in Escondido, initiatives for citizens to get engaged and work on projects uh, collaboratively together. And there's a whole series of interesting tools that allow us to organize digitally communities and get them involved in working around initiatives. Not just working, but also voicing their opinion, doing online surveys, doing uh, feeling connected, using geography as a common framework. 
Well, uh, I'm going to finish now, if you don't mind. Uh, I wanted to cover a few big topics. First, GIS has been evolving. It's becoming pervasive infrastructure. And this will kick in more and more every year. It's actually accelerating. And this is going to this is going to provide a powerful nervous system for the planet. And it'll be inclusive of many participants, including geodesign professionals. It's going to change how we see and understand. It'll reshape how we design, and it'll transform organizations. It's going to make us smarter and more efficient and effective. And you, as professionals, your work, I want you to understand, is part of something much larger. Your contributions to this nervous system will be important. They'll influence and create the future, our future. And to realize this, to realize the idea of a sustainable future, so that humans are still around, we need more than just technology. This isn't just a technology thing. It requires the implementation and effective use of that with intelligent action. This really means geodesign. It means good governance, thinking. It means the values, um, the ethics, and the hard work to pull this off. That's what this conference is about. It's also about going all in with it, just like you did when you chose to pick a design career. You said, I'm going to go all in on this. This is no different. And only you can do this. You can only make these decisions. But obviously you're here. This is a good sign, or listening over the web. That's a good, good evidence that uh, we have something going here. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for being here. And uh, it's going to be a pretty exciting couple of days. Thank you. <laughs>